Hello everyone, happy Friday, and welcome to another episode of Quantries and Sundries. I hope you are doing well and had an amazing day today. So let's end this week off strong with a whole slew of stories to pique your fancy and the science and history itch you deserve. So let's hop right into this. Let's start off with our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees. What if I told you that chimpanzees are smart enough to self-medicate and heal their own wounds? Not only theirs, but their family members and even strangers they come across. This is not a new discovery, as many animal species throughout the animal kingdom have been observed self-medicating to combat pathogens and various parasites. And we have known that chimpanzees have learned to eat certain types of leaves and foods to combat parasites and different types of infections. But this is the first time we have observed chimpanzees crushing up bugs and applying them to wounds as a salve to heal said wounds. And while we still don't know yet what insect species they use to heal their wounds, we do know that they are flying insects of some sort and that they catch them out of the air from our observations. But what is even weirder is that in the decades we have been investigating and studying chimpanzees, we have never observed this habit. So that begs the question, if this is a new part of their evolution we are starting to observe. We have even been able to see groups of chimpanzees being taught how to apply bugs to their wounds, meaning that they are learning from one another and teaching one another. And this will eventually become a common practice amongst the species. The idea of applying insects to wounds is not unusual. As far back as 1400 BC, humans have done the same for therapeutic and medical purposes for their antibiotic effects. And in remote regions of the world, tribes still observe this practice. But it begs the question, again, if this is like an evolutionary trait being developed, or is it a tribe practice, a.k.a. a specific region, chimpanzees, cultural practice, like human tribes having their own methods to heal the body. Nevertheless, I would love to find out what insects they're using, and how long they've been doing this, and if we could learn something from our closest living relatives. Next, let's talk a little international political news. And I know I don't like to cover political news, but I'm not going to count this as political news. I'm going to count this as eco-friendly news, because I really love this story. We're talking about the recent unveiling of Indonesia's new capital. Their current capital, Jakarta, home to over 10 million people, home to many faiths and backgrounds, and even though the city was founded in the 16th century, its ports have been a major stop for sailors, ships, and trade for the last 1,700 years. But in recent years and in recent decades, with the fear of global warming and rising sea tides leading to mass flooding in the cities, not to mention massive tsunamis. I mean, if Krakatoa goes off again, Jakarta is basically doomed. And then there's their huge pollution and overcrowdedness. But in 2019, President Joko Widodo made the announcement that by the year 2045, the capital would be moved to the island of Borneo, and a new capital by the name of Nusantara, meaning Palin Peninsula, would be born. A bold claim but he made an even, even bigger claim that I support that this new city will be renewable, green, and have net zero emissions. One of the biggest problems when trying to have Indonesia hit that net zero emissions goal set by the Paris Agreement was the fact that Jakarta was overcrowded and overpolluted. They didn't want to be that way. Their population and infrastructure got to such a point where there was no turning back. So this new plan will include affordable, energy-efficient high-rises made from 100% renewable materials, a new traffic system where the city will be arranged so that you won't have to drive, but you can easily use clean public transportation, or bikes, or just walk on foot. And to not seem so futuristic and unwelcoming, every citizen inside the city will be within 10 minutes walking distance from a green recreational space. So it won't feel so crowded and so metropolitan. There's actually going to be greenery and trees. And you won't believe how big this will be. This will be a whopping 1,590 square miles or 2,560 square kilometers. 
Now, for people who don't know size, and I'm not the best when it comes to size, I'm going to give a reference. New York City has an area of 472 square miles, or 1,223 square kilometers. That makes this new city legitimately like four times larger. It's going to be massive. This is making this a gargantuan project that will cost the Indonesian government $32 billion. However, it is without its controversy, as currently renewable clean energy only accounts for 11% of Indonesia's electrical infrastructure, while the other 89% comes from fossil fuels and coal-burning plants. So they will need to make a huge change. Also, especially since they're planning to move the people as well, that will be a huge undertaking and a huge amount of work. Well, I'm all for this, and I love the idea so much and fully support it. Renewable energy is also a concern of mine as well, and how they can actually make the housing affordable. Usually when a project like this is done, it's less creating utopia and more gentrifying and leading, leaving out those who aren't as privileged or fortunate. And so I do have some doubts. There's also the thought that just like what's happening in Puerto Rico, millionaires could move in to the new city from around the world and take advantage and taxes could go up, but only time will tell and then we'll have to actually see what happens. But like I said, only time will tell how they can handle this and if it's a good effort and if they can actually do this. I've, I'm all for it at the end of the day. I think this is a great idea. I think we need to um, take the step to more eco-conscious cities, especially with overpopulation and pollution. I will definitely keep you posted on this. If you have made it this far into the show, I'd really appreciate if whatever platform you listen to this on, whether YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or whatever audio platform my voice is transmitting to you through, please subscribe or follow me. And please, I love any feedback, so don't feel shy to tell me what you think, whether it be through the YouTube comments or on my social media. Now let's get right back into it. I want to end on some dino news. Dolly the Dinosaur, famously named after Dolly Parton, is in the news because of a fascinating and interesting new discovery. In the mountains of Montana in the 1990s, only the skull and neck vertebrae of a sauropod were discovered, and according to estimates, it had to have died at the age of 20, and at a size of 60 feet or 18 meters. But what this made this majestic beast die so young? Well, after all these years, we might know now. Upon closely examining a few of her neck bones and noticing abnormal growths and protrusions in the bones. But first, I want to do a little history on the dinosaurs. We have observed, based on the skeletal structures, that a few species of sauropods have a complex network of air sacs up and down their spine to possibly aid in breathing capacity because of their size. And according to CT scans of Dolly, it seems that the bones abnormally grew in response to a respiratory infection or in one or two of the sacs. In any creature, bones can grow fast when one experiences trauma to aid in protecting the body. But because of the complex system of air sacs feeding to the lungs, this bone growth probably caused severe respiratory problems, shortening her life and revealing to us the first example in history of a dinosaur having a disease. It has always been theorized that one of the reasons the dinosaurs went extinct was because of disease. And of course, every creature on this planet can die from disease. But this is our first concrete evidence of disease in dinosaurs. The researchers theorized even more and suggested that based on her place and time and her location, which was 150 million years ago in Montana, where at the time most of the nation was divided by a seaway at the foot of the Rocky Mountains, mean that Montana more closely resembled, let's say, the Gulf of Mexico, leading to a humid climate that was perfect for the growth of fungal infections to spread amongst the population. And because during the breeding season they tended to stick together in a tightly knit group, she could have gotten it from a family member or neighbor. And while we still need to know more, it's fascinating to know what their life was like. We should CT scan more dinosaur skeletons and see what we find. As long as we don't go all Jurassic Park, I'm completely fine with it. Well, that is all I got for today. Thank you so much for listening, and do not forget to share this to anyone or all those in your life 
You could use a scientific moment in theirs. I hope you all join me again next week for another episode of Quandaries and Sundries. And I hope you all have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay sane, and stay healthy. This is Ven Masterson, signing off. Till we meet next time.